So, welcome to the podcast and to the Big Rab Show in general, Ali Levac. Ali, how are you, sir? Not too bad, yourself, Rab. What's the crack? The best, mate. Thanks. And if anything, it's just brilliant to have you on the show, honestly. It seems to be we've been talking about you and your career now for years. It's great to finally talk to you. No, I'm delighted to be on the show. I've been watching it for the, like, the past two years and I, I, I shamelessly admit that I am a fan. And oh, then, uh, there you go. So, and then I discovered your TikTok and I was like, oh, super fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you've been kind of watching me struggling learning how to pipe then and all of those terrible uh, squeaky they're, videos. They're, they're so good. That I love it though. Like the, I can't, and some of them are outrageous, your TikTok. <laughs> some of them are kind of out there. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. But yeah, so for those of you watching, if you want to go and see me on TikTok, you can, but there you go. Uh, Grant, I've got a few questions I need to ask you then, Ali. Well, first of all, I have to introduce you to folks living internationally who may not know who you are, um, but you are kind of rel- pretty famous now here in the UK because you've won the Young Scots Trad Musician of the Year Award 2020. Can you tell us what that was like, actually winning it? Yeah, so it was, um, it's been going since I think 2001, I think, or 2000, maybe. I think so, Gillian Frame was the first yeah. person to win it. And then the mm-hmm. first Piper to win it, well, a couple of years after that was 2002 or 2004, Stuart Cassells. Stuart, yeah, I thought, it was, I was thinking it was Stuart, I just didn't want to put my, my eggs in the basket there. Yeah. No, yeah, and it was, <laughs> after that he started like chilies and stuff and then, yeah. so yeah, I first discovered it in like 2007 when I was up in Blockton Music School and I was like, I think Rudy McMillan, the fiddle player and uh, Blaze Biddles won it that year and then I was like, oh, I fancy that, like, it was good and then, um, I had a good, a good few attempts before I did win it. I was in the semis and that was as far as I got. And yeah. once I applied, I think it was 2014, I never got anywhere. And then got to the final once before and then fell short. And then, um, I don't know, yeah, just like kind of tightened the, the, tightened the screws. I knew where I was going wrong in the final I was in before where I didn't make it. And then I kind of just went in a bit whimsily, a bit loose. And the pipe, like the pipes weren't totally... Singing, I didn't really tighten the bolts for that. And then this, for this last one, I made a point of kind of seeing a couple of folk like Finley McDonald in Glasgow and uh, stuff just before my set, just to kind of check things over. I think that definitely helped. But um, yeah, Stuart being the like Stuart was so nice as well to me because he was one of the judges actually the year I won it. Stuart oh, Cassells. Right. Yeah. And then he came up after, and it's, it's kind of nice to. To be that, to have that relationship with him as being the only couple who won it, yeah. and then, but the pipers that have gone come in it and competed even as well are unbelievable. Like Lauren McDougall, That's Stephen Blake there for times, and I think James James McKenzie as well. Had James then, McKenzie, uh, had Ross Miller. There's been a, a lot of pipers through the years. Bradley, Bradley Parker, as Bradley well. Parker recently, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I love his set. I think he did a thing. He taped his uh, like the. The whole, like his low G hole. Right. But it, he taped it completely over shut. Right. So it gave it like a, an, F, an F sharp instead of like a G. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, hey. There you it was go. cool. It was cool. Yeah. You can watch that back on his semi final set. There you go. I'll have to watch that actually. Yeah. That's there you cool. go. It was really cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
So after having won the title, I'm sure the floodgates open for you, Ali, because that seemed to be when it really kicked off for you. You know, we've been following you as your numerous attempts throughout the years. And then to yeah. get you in the final, we were like, yes, we have ah. the final, you know, and then we were all singing your praises and stuff. But then whenever you won, it just seemed to be right. There's music, there's books, there's gigs, there's everything all seemed to happen for you. Yeah. For when, how, how did you find things after lifting the title then? Um, sorry about that. My dad kept me grass outside. If, you, if you're hearing that buzz, <laughs> you're okay. I can't um, hear. You're okay. <laughs> but, but, um, I it was good. Like I was elated after the win, and because um, the night before the win, uh, my band Project Smock, we mm. released our debut album in the old fruit market. That's right. Um, yeah. Debuts. So it was literally the day before I was. So that made the weekend nuts, and then it kind of like the boys were saying. There was pressure on the on after the album launch. It was like, right now you have to win, so that'll help the album. Otherwise, yeah. <laughs> don't win. Then the plot. I was like, oh my gosh. So oh. yeah, then we thought when that I was like, right, okay, that will get us loads of gigs now. And then ugh, what what happened happened with COVID. It was going to happen anyway. And like, we'll still we'll still use this as a as a as a catapult sort of thing or a platform to try and get gigs and stuff and. But um, I was actually, and then shortly after, the, when I went to America, I was in tour with a, an Irish dance show called Rhythm of the Dance. And then, because hmm. that's a kind of quiet time of the year for gigs, sort of February, March. So I went out there anyway. It was halfway through the tour, actually. We, that's, we got called home, like about a week short because of everything kicking off. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, I see. Oh, there yeah. So when you were off enjoying yourself, then you got pulled back. Yeah. 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 And I think, I mean, like, for me, like, COVID's been hellish for some people and but then for me i think i've actually i think it's probably obviously it sucks like no gigs and stuff but it's actually yeah. helped me loads because i was right. like i was just living from gig to gig before yeah. and i never ever recorded anything or released anything and i was just gigging and going out and i never released anything and it was like through covid i was like i have to do something it's the fear and I, the first week i think i i didn't even own a an, inter an audio interface or a proper <laughs> recording microphone, yeah, nothing. Nothing for recording, I, yeah, yeah. No, nothing. And then the first week of lockdown, I was like, MacBook Pro, audio interface, Focusrite, um, Aston Origin microphone, so I can yeah. release stuff, Logic, and then, so give me a kick up the backside, I think. But then and I guess. Yeah, yeah we're, we're going to talk about that. You've been incredibly busy and we will talk about some quite exciting new releases that you have coming. Can I ask then about not only are you doing your own solo stuff, but you're also involved with two other bands, Glenn and Project Smock. You just mentioned them there. Do you want to talk about your involvement with both of these groups, Tim? You know, yeah. how much time do you have? <laughs> it's, it's funny because I, I never would have thought I'd be uh, or have as many sort of projects as that. I used to, <laughs> I used to be a, a bit of a tearaway like, through uni and stuff and... Um, uh, I was probably kicked out of more bands than I was in bands back then. <laughs> and, uh, but then when I look back, and I think COVID definitely turned that around for me. I've kind of mm. I look back on how I was then, and I was like, "How the heck did I get by?" But um, I love the freedom in Project Smock because I'm the only melodist. But like mm. the three of us in Project Smock, it's myself, and Pablo Lacamente on guitar, mm -hmm. and you and Baird on Bowden. And then we've each got our own, we've got loads of space to ourselves. So I've got, every gig's different as well. The tunes change all the time, or the <laughs> melodies, because I, I can do what I want. And then Pablo as well, he, he's, he can change chords as he sees fit, because he's the only chordal um, accompaniment. And then Ewan as well, the only sort of percussion in it. So there's room yeah, there. And then yeah. that's Smock. And then Glynn started, it was myself and Craig Irving. Craig used to play in Man Man and Talisk yeah, as well. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we've been we've been like best mates for for years. And then he's because he's from up here. We were both spending loads of time just hanging out together because of COVID. And then um, uh, we just thought let's just record loads of stuff and just the two of us. And yeah, it's a happy act. Yeah. I have to say, the freedom that you're finding with the music at the moment is so refreshing. It's just amazing to watch and listen to, you know, because uh, for those of you who know you for your whistle playing, obviously, you're an outstanding whistle player, if you don't mind me saying, but you're yes. also 
quite an accomplished bagpiper as well. Like you've been involved in the solo scene and that as well throughout your days. Can you tell yeah. us how you got your start then in playing in general? What made you lift yeah. the instrument? Um, so yeah, I started when I was nine years old. Through my grandfather, he got me on the chanter. Mm-hmm. And then it was just, what would it have been? It would have been, it was just pure piping, solo piping. Yeah. Um, from nine until 15, to the age of 15. And then I'd go into like Highland mm-hmm. Games and sort of juvenile competitions, um, US Dimbara, Royal yeah. Meetings and stuff, to the juniors. And then, mm-hmm. and then it was, I went to Plockton when I was about 15, like starting third year high school. And then you have to pick up a second instrument. So that's, that's where I got whistle. But I went to a few tutors before then. I was, what did I start with? I started with like a local tutor, Benny Manson mm-hmm. in Dingwall. He's passed away since. But then I was always, I was going up to my grandfather's just right up the house in some Peffer every night. He was sort of like my mentor and he played pipes as well. So he'd be able to know, he never competed or anything, but he, he could fiddle and pipes and he'd know sort of, he could tell the difference between something being good or bad. Correct so or incorrect, yeah, that kind of thing, yeah. On the straight lines and he'd know like, like I remember his favorite tune for me so was like Danella Beaton and like a single grace note missed in that tune he's like right back to the start. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was like, oh, days of that. But then, and then we went to a few tutors, I went back to John Burgess as well. Oh, wow, John, yeah. In Saltburn, just in Invergarden and he was great. Um, I think it was more, there was more good crack than anything than, than teaching in the lessons <laughs> and stories. And then Alice, um, Norman Gillis as well. Alistair was father. Right. Um, yeah. For lessons with him as well. I had to shut his lorries as well. They were a great set of pipes. And then, and then it was after John passed away. Um, he, I went up to lessons with Ian McFadden. Oh, right. With Ian. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And so he's had, he's kind of how I got involved in the music school up in Block and he was like mm-hmm. living in he was living in Kyle and he's like just go to the music school here I'll be able to see you once a week then and there so yeah go. that's quite a pedigree now but you were never involved in the band scene that was a couple of questions actually we got in if I was ever speaking to you just ask was you ever playing in bands I don't think you did did you no no I never and it was only I don't know why that never happened like I love. Um, I loved the solo scene and I actually tried to get back into it. I kind of fell out of it for a couple of years there just because of gigs and Kayleigh's getting in the way. And I spoke yeah. to James McKenzie actually about how he got back into it mm-hmm. after being in Breivach and stuff. And then he went and won the, did he won the silver medal? I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But um, with, after being in a hiatus of the, the competing scene. Mm. Um, but... Um, Sorry, what was the what was your question again? No, I was going to say that you never actually oh, went bands. into the band thing. Yeah. No. Yeah. I don't. Know. I, I gave. I, there was sort of there was local bands up here, but nothing. There was no competing bands really, yeah. and then they were all down, like Central Belt in Glasgow or yeah. over the water with yourselves. That's it. And least. then yeah. the, the first kind of the first kind of sniff of maybe joining a band, I was. Uh, chatting to Chris Armstrong and there was, ah, there was yeah. come to our practice and I almost did and then I don't know I just I, I don't just, know why I never, never made I loved, the jump no yeah. no I like I kind of like the is it good what, like that I can just change it slightly or is it going to be different yeah yeah the, but even in, even in even in normal in like I think it boil, boils down to why I'm not in a band with another melody player. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I hate, and this is bad. I'm a nightmare for, I'm a nightmare deck. I have to <laughs> deck for someone in a band. I'm a nightmare. Because the, the, the deck's job is to play the parts of the, the main Perfect. musician who can't make yeah. a gig. And I'm just like, I, I can't. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I like it to be different every single time. There you go. That's it. And that's it. That's what I was saying earlier about the freedom that you're having with the music. And that, that's what makes it so fascinating to watch, honestly. Yeah. Because we don't have that freedom in the band world. You know, you play your dots on the page, your MSR. I, I, and that's I, it. Appreciate, I appreciate the band scene. And then, like, hmm. when I hear, like, when I watch it, like Field Marshall and stuff, and 
um, really, but it sounds like one, it's, it, it's like a well-oiled machine. Oh, it is. They yeah. make that many people sound like one. And I, I, when I watch it, I go, yep. I go, <laughs> I have that. <laughs> I really struggle. <laughs> So can I ask you then, when we're talking about playing in bands and such, uh, you were involved in the BBC Proms, and that you've played with some huge orchestras as well, mm. standing centre stage in front of all of these musicians. What does that feel like as a trad musician? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's really out of place. It was, it was a totally weird experience, and I spoke to Benny Morris, actually, the fiddle player, yeah. who won the Young Trads the year before. Um, was it? The year before I won. The year before, yeah. 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 He's he's originally like, he's originally a classically trained musician. So right. I was getting a few tips from him on, on how to because it's so different. And he was mm. saying like three things that someone wouldn't normally tell me that he said the conductor don't follow his beat bang on. I was looking at the conductor like follow his yeah, like follow the guy, bang, yeah. But the orchestra is slightly behind him. So I was, it sounded like I, I'm a wee bit ahead. And that's just, a, that's just an experience thing. Like right. I would have never known if Benny hadn't told me sort of thing. So there's a couple of moments where I'm going like that, but it's cause it's, that's the norm that the orchestra, there's a delay between yeah. when it brings the gauntlet down. Yeah, a split running. second of a thing. Yeah, there you go. That's fascinating. Yeah. But it's still, funny. I like to have that, you know, that behind you and to feel that music coming through that it's bound yeah. to have been special yeah what was it like up there then i would love to i would love to do it again um with the, with the bbc it was the sso i was playing with the scottish yeah. symphony orchestra um and after doing it because it was the first time i was as soon as it was finished i was like i want to do that again because i would do this <laughs> differently and i'd maybe do this slightly differently it's, it's all it was totally about like feel mm. and it was only after yeah. i played with them that i realized that i was like oh i'm so immersed in like playing tight but it's not about yeah. being like bang on tight it's just like about feeling it with the which was was so Same. bizarre yeah. But it was, yeah with them behind you it's like a total yeah yeah i, I think that that's possibly the best description of it there <laughs> yeah yeah so I can, can i i need to ask you some technical piping questions because we are a piping show of course uh so can i ask you then as being a bagpiper first who moved on to whistles can you tell us about that transition did you find it easy to move from pipes to whistle was it mm, i remember hard? there being a when i hear my whistle playing if I was to imagine it back, it's, hmm. it sounds a wee bit like a piper playing a whistle. Um, yeah. But then I think from just from listening, I think to other players more than anything else, that's the main thing. I started to be able to separate the two. Right. So I see. like from like bands like Fluke and like Brian Finnegan and stuff and yeah. Um, Alan Mike, Mike McGoldrick and other well, yeah. to start dropping all these amazing muscle players, yeah. <laughs> that was the main thing, Hamish Napier, he was my tutor for whistle. Yeah. He said just listen, listen, listen to other people. And then I think that's how it came on. But hmm. I think because the because of the 
competitive piping background and then you get strength in fingering. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that makes it easier almost, I think. There you go. So that's interesting because I do know a lot of pipers try to lift the whistle and, and attempt it, but just give up after like two or three weeks because they just can't get it. But although some pipers really seem to thrive and enjoy <laughs> the freedom, and I think you're certainly a prime example of that, Ali. You know, <laughs> that took the yeah. instrument and ran with it. <laughs> but, I think for, but like I did go a while, a couple of years ago, where it was whistle, 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 and I came back to the pipes. I was like, oh God, like I need to remember to uh, give attention to both because it was like it although i was really happy with where my whistle playing was at and it was really free and fluid mm. i thought ah, because of that the piping would be fine and i was like no 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 the piping needs the sort of like the weight yes yeah. and the the strength behind it and i had to really kind of after that and i actually i spoke to fred morrison about this a few years ago i'm still kind of getting over it mm -hmm. um i don't know what it is or how it happened but I had a problem with my E grace note oh. and the ring finger on my left hand. Left hand, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we were, I was competing at the, the competition in Laureate. Mm -hmm. And David Sheridan, it was myself, I think the representatives of Scotland was like my, myself, Fred Morrison, mm -hmm. uh, David Sheridan and Callum Moffat from right, Glasgow. Right. And then David was saying, whenever I played a Torlua or a Kroonlua, Mm -hmm. My shoulder was going like that. So I spoke to Fred about it. He's, he, oh, it's almost yeah. like he'd heard about it before, though. He said, don't worry about it. I've known a couple of people who've had it for. It's like going nuts. And I was getting <laughs> down from it. And I was like, is it like a tap nerve? Is it uh, 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 like RSI, yeah. repetitive brain injury? And I'm just sort of, I don't know what it is. I think it was from the, about, like the, that time of leaving the pipes for a good few months. Yeah, yeah. Like coming back, it was... But it started to come back yeah, from me just sort of going back to the basics. Going back to that, yeah, foundation. It's so, yeah. It's, only, it's so frustrating because everything else is fine. And it's <laughs> that one finger, it's like, oh. See, that's it. The bagpipes can humble the best of us, for sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. I love that, though. <laughs> <laughs> so can I ask you some real nerdy questions about setup yeah. then? Uh, so what sort of whistles do you use on a regular gig? What would be your brand um, of choice? Yeah, I've got them here. I'll just show you. They're all sure. They're yeah. all um, Colin Goldie mainly. All oh, right. Colin, Colin Goldie whistles mainly, and I actually so the only one that I don't, the only whistle I play which is not a Goldie currently is a an MK Low D. Oh, there you go. Oh. Uh, the only reason I play the MK now is I did have a Goldie Low D, but the a mate of mine I left my set of border pipes mm -hmm. in the Hardy's soft case behind her car, and she actually reversed over them. Oh no! Yeah, the pipes oh. are fine, but she snapped the Low D in half. Ouch! Oh god! So, that, there you go. Yeah, that, that's so it, easy done. Mainly, mainly Goldies, and I've kind of like loads of Goldies, and I kind of like I've, oh. I've most keys. And then to have some comment on a smock post recently, mm -hmm. when, when, when we put music together with smock, we kind of try things out mm -hmm. with different whistles. So we'll be trying different keys, but I'll be playing the same fingering, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was just a different key of whistle each time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it'll just be a different, a different sonic different range. Basically. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go with whichever suits best. But that, with that, comes that our music is in odd keys and stuff um yeah so like c sharp minor and stuff and then we had some comment saying from spain i think it was and so it's like ah like your music but why are you play in such awkward keys <laughs> uh, play on low d i was like oh it's, no it's not about that it's like if, if a lot of the sets we play our tunes if we were to play them on the d mm -hmm. or another whistle it wouldn't sound as we kind of searched for what sounds best sonically? Yeah, the the, the key and the, the kind of the pitch of it that would raise the music that wee bit higher. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. totally. Exactly. And then yeah, Goldies mainly. Happy days. So, what about pipes then? Uh, what's your model of choice? Yeah, I've I've got them here. I'll show you, I'll show you the case as well. So this is okay. the actually this is the case. I actually worked in Hardy's for a year. Oh yeah, there you I go. Um, nice. Worked there in 2017 due to 2018 and it's a set of um lorries 
that I played. Ooh, That's nice. in 19, 1908. Set of wow, so they're proper. Ooh, look at those. Yeah. Well, they're Very nice. good neck, though. And then sort of just a plastic mouthpiece. Mm-hmm. Um, and I play, I'm currently playing as like a prototype um, plastic RG Hardy chanter in B flat. Oh. That I made myself. But that, but I, so I'm in, I'm in B flat just now. I haven't mm-hmm. been in. Uh, sort of competitive piping yeah. pitch for a wee while. And I was speaking to Ross Ainsley about that when we were because he was supposed to be we were supposed to be doing Lorient this year mm-hmm. for the invitation. And um, he was asking me, he said, "Are you in B flat or are you in competitive chilling, pitch? Is it, yeah, competitive yeah. chilling?" Yeah, and yeah. I said, I'm in B flat just now, and I said, "I don't know if I'm going to tune up yeah. for." The competition. And he said, yeah. he said, if everybody, he made a good point. He said, if everyone's in band tuning and you go on B flat, even if it's like, it'd be like, Bleh. way down. Yeah. 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 <laughs> It'll make it seem a lot lower. So, but I actually, it was up this, the middle drone in this, the middle tenor, the middle part. Mm-hmm. Um, I was at a gig, a uh, Kaylee in Glasgow a couple of years ago, and then this drunk idiot, like, mm-hmm. I, that's just why I hate. I've only got the one set of Highlands at the moment. I'm yeah. trying to get together. Um, I was ho- hoping to ask Blue McMurchie, uh, oh. bagpipe maker, bagpipe maker maker in West Calder. Right, interesting. Sort yeah, like, he's sort of like one of the last bagpipe makers by hand. Wow, um, yeah, he's, he's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, check. Like, I think he has a website. Like Blue McMurchie is his name. Oh, I'll have to check yeah. for that. Yeah, he, he does like copies of. Um, old Hendersons and lorries like exactly so this boy at the Cayley stood on my lorries oh. and then I had him up against the wall I was like oh God, <laughs> and the, yeah. tuning, the only thing that had snapped was well was the tuning peg on the middle tenor yeah that was fine and then so I went to blue I said oh Stephen Blake actually put me on to he's got mm-hmm. a full set of pipes made from him and then blue had the square block and just in a matter of minutes all by hand made an exact copy of the Wow, so t- of the yeah, he was able to piece it together then. Of that, yeah, that and it was actually it was in better nick. That he he kind of gun drilled the the bores as well, so they were in better nick, and he made yeah. the reed seats deeper because I think they're, they're quite high in these uh, these old pipes. Ah, there you go. So, yeah, fascinating stuff. You know, honestly, I could chat to you about all of this geeky pipe and stuff forever. Yeah. Honestly. <laughs> so thank you for that.
so right, we need to get on to the whole thrust of the interview. You have a brand new book coming out now. Can you tell us about it? The reason why we're happy on the show to begin with. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Cheers. The, so the, the books came about because uh, last, it was almost a year ago actually, last May, so right. just the, yeah. almost at the beginning of lockdown, I was like, what am I going to do for money? Oh my gosh. And then um, I made a silly wee video on Instagram saying, if anyone's wanting a tune <clears throat> composed for them, that I would compose them a tune yes. um, right. and then hand write it and frame it and send it to them in the post and they can right. choose the name of it. That's right. I remember that we were talking about it on the show. Yeah, yeah, and it was it was um, it was good. I thought if I get five or six um, folk get in touch, I'd be happy with that. So yeah. then I think I ended up like sixty folk got in touch. I was like, oh. wow. <laughs> I, I, I had a week window to get in touch. My folks were saying you need to cap it. I was like, I need the money. <laughs> <laughs> so it was good because I'd never I'd never sat down to compose before. And I thought, like, I didn't want to just give folk the first thing that came out. So Mm. anything I gave, I I was happy with. And then there was techniques of composing that I um, discovered that I'll I'll show you just now as well that I loved. Really Mm -hmm. funny ways of recording. But um, I'll I'll set up for that whilst I'm telling you about the book. So then, yeah, after... So I was left after the commission project with um, 60 tunes. And then I thought, that's the donkey work that I've done for books. Definitely. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what I was going to say. This first yeah. volume that you're releasing right now has, what, 35 tunes in it, Ali? And then do we, yeah. I think that on your website as well, you can actually see volume two available as well. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just going to, I'm just going to um, launch both at the same time. Right. Right. Yeah. Volume one and two. Mm-hmm. Um, just because the t- the tunes are there, the, the, this is sort of like I could have done it as one big book mm-hmm. um, of s- seventy tunes, yeah. say. But then I kind of like most of the layouts of like um, the R. S. McDonald, um, Ross Ainsley, Ali Hatton, Gordon yes. Duncan books have about forty tunes mm-hmm. in them. And photos, so I, I and I like the the size and the, the layout, the staple and everything. So I, I, mm-hmm. do, I do one of them, and then I thought I have enough for two. So but it's sort of like a, a life's work. And then the, the boys were saying, "Why why are you doing two? And I was like, "Well, it's, just, it's sort of like every tune of, and it's it's mm-hmm. other tunes as well. It's not just the commission tunes. It's sort of like every tune of other I yeah. yeah. So I started composing. There you go. So oh. if anything, that's what I was going to say. That the genius behind these two volumes is because. They're not huge, big volumes, but they're small enough for you to be able to throw in your pipe bag. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you can the, take them with you places. The, the usual size of what kind of pipe books are today, like R.S. McDonald one. Yeah. And that, that's a great book as well, actually, and Ross's. And, mm-hmm. Yeah, the Untreacherous is booking stuff as well. So. That's it, indeed. So by way of a shameless plug then, Ali, when or where can folks go and grab these? Where can they get their hands yeah. on? So they can, the, the pre-orders are open just now. I'm going to be doing a, a good few pushes and, and posts and stuff over the next week um but pre-orders are open and will be open for till the middle or the end of june and um, mm-hmm. when i hope to go to print um I've, all the tunes are so are finished it's mm-hmm. just a case now of me putting the photographs and the language in the books but you can get pre-orders now uh via my website <clears throat> Uh, there you are love that fantastic now can i ask you then a personal question this is just from me one of my favorite tunes of yours that i cannot stop listening to is compliments to ailey smith can you tell me about this tune there has to be a story behind this yeah oh <laughs> it's, um, i don't know if you know the story do you i don't know that's why i'm okay. asking <laughs> So I was, um, I was in Thailand in 2015. Uh, I had a gig in Singapore. And then I thought, the, the rest of the lads were flying back. And I said, can you make my flight like a month later? Right, like, yeah. a month. I was like, yeah, I'm going to go to Thailand for myself for a month. So I did that. And then mm-hmm. um, by the end of the trip, I had no money left. I was completely broke. And I had a three, three days um, oh, no. stuck in Singapore. I had nowhere to stay. And I was oh, like, gosh. 
I was listen. no cash, nothing. And I was literally going to, I was sort of beneath that big massive hotel with the ship. Oh the yeah. Yeah. With no money, walking around with my bags. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going to be sleeping on the street. And then I phoned, I don't know why I did this. I phoned my granny. Mm-hmm. Just like, just for comfort, I think more than anything else. And she's yeah. like, oh, where are you? I was like, I'm, I'm in Singapore. And she's like, oh, wait, I know um, so-and-so. I, I didn't tell my granny I had no money or nowhere to stay. Yeah, she's yeah. like, oh, I know um, Ailey Smith. She's living out there. I was like, oh, do you? And then uh, she said, have you got somewhere to stay? And I said, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at the pavement, though, and she said, give me two minutes. And my granny's like in her mid-80s. And then she pulled me back after two minutes, and then she said, um, Ailey's going to get in touch with you. You're staying at Ailey's for the next two days. I was like, wow. Oh, life. Oh, so, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Oh, that's, that's so cool. Like I said, it has been one of my favorite tunes of yours. And uh, now I know this incredible story behind it. That's brilliant. Well, I had Fantastic. nothing to give Ailey. So it was actually when I was in Singapore, I was like, I have nothing to give you, so have this tune. <laughs> well, hi, it's a cracking tune for sure. Yeah, I love it. Uh, so we've got some big rap show staples that we ask every single guest, regardless of who they are. Uh, so you're not getting away with it. I have to ask you these as well. Uh, so, Ali, what is your favorite cheese? My favorite cheese? Yes. I, I'm not a massive cheese connoisseur, but I do love um, just the cathedral extra mature on uh, those water biscuit crackers. Oh, know yes, that's not yeah. here now. <laughs> Behave yourself. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I also ask you then, it's a question we've asked some of the big names and I've, they've had to scratch their heads on this one, but have you got a most embarrassing moment in all of your days of playing that you could pick out as going particularly cringy? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, on, on a gig, particularly. On a gig or performance of any kind, Anything like that, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's, there's, there's a couple. Um, <laughs> I can't think of one in particular. What's the most embarrassing? Yeah. I think, I remember playing in, like, it was a gig in Australia in a church, mm-hmm. and I was sitting down, sort of like this, sort of, like, 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 like that, and, yeah. and then I got up and then started walking along the church, and I thought, this woman as I was walking back up the middle was like um, pulled me in and then I thought she was going to say like oh really enjoyed your set she was like yeah. your flies open <laughs> and it wasn't even no. a lot it. it was like so open oh no <laughs> oh my god that's pretty terrible so that's um, not even anything to do with your plan that's to do with your well your dress I suppose I know I was like oh, oh my god <laughs> mortifying that's horrible that, well yeah I- very positive note then. I think we'll end it there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ali, honestly, I wish you the best of success with Glenn, Project Smart, and all of your solo work, man. I am a huge fan. It's been great yeah, chatting to you on the show. I um, really appreciate it. Being fun. Cheers. No problem. And as I was going to say, do you want to remind the folk listening or watching this video right now, where can they go and grab copies of your upcoming books? Yeah. So you can get, uh, you can pre-order uh, volumes one and volumes two of my upcoming tune books now via my website www.alidavac.com and the deal that's on just now is exclusive to folk who pre-order it's they're 15 pounds each or if you order both it's 25 there you go so you may as well get both like you know really <laughs> <laughs> for sure ali it's been a pleasure mate thank you so much and hopefully we'll get you back on a future show there's got tons of questions here we haven't actually got through so oh really yeah, yeah, it'd be great to have you back if you're yeah, if you're up I for it. Where where is it you're phoning from? Uh well, sunny Northern Ireland. Yeah, yeah. I hopefully <laughs> hopefully we'll get the uh, a podcast in person or something. I I, oh. I I was normally over all the time, so hopefully when things are a wee bit calmed down, we'll, we can have one in person. Hundred percent. That sounds like a plan for sure. Ali Levac, thank you so much for chatting to us here on the podcast, mate. Take care. Cheers, man. Thanks so much. <laughs>